Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and welcome to part seven, yes, seven, of my fourth video game generation retrospective. Part one was about the generation as a whole, part two was on the TurboGrafx-16, three, the Sega Genesis, aka Mega Drive, four, the Sega CD, Mega CD, five, the 32X by Sega, uh, six, the Super Nintendo, aka Super Famicom, and seven, the SNK Neo Geo AES. So this console is absolutely fascinating to me especially. I don't know how many, I hope you guys find it fascinating. Um, but yeah, this console is so bizarre because it, it succeeded despite defying just about every single gaming convention there is. Like it did just about everything wrong, yet was considered a success. So let's start with a little bit of history on this thing. This console came out technically in 1990, December 31st, 1990. That's when it launched in Japan, and then saw a North American release in summer of 91, and I believe it came out in Europe in uh, the holidays of 91 as well. Really didn't do very well in Europe. Didn't do that great in, in America, but it did decently in Japan. And I know that's not a big selling statement for this console that did pretty well, but you'll hear me out. You'll understand. So... The, this console was made by SNK. Now, they're a, a pretty cool company, but at that point, and still now, I guess, are basically known for arcade hardware. You know, you go in, you pull, put some quarters in a machine, you play the game. That's what they did, and they were good at that. And they at one point decided they wanted to consoleize their arcade hardware for home use. Now, that was nothing new. Atari did that. Uh, Sega did that. I mean, that, that was one of Sega's claims about the Genesis was, you're bringing our arcade home to your house and you can play it. But Atari and Sega ran into a problem, which was the economic viability of doing that. See, arcade hardware is really expensive. So consoleizing it would have meant an insanely expensive console. So they didn't do that. They cheaped out. Yes, technically you were getting inferior versions, but I don't think too many people really cared because they had good game consoles they could enjoy. SNK actually did that. They took their arcade hardware and consoleized it. And as far as I, as from what I understand, it really wasn't that different from the actual machines they were using, which is insane, as you will see. The first issue with this console that should have killed it and would have killed and did kill any other console that tried to do anything like this was the price. Now here's the thing, when this console came out there were two versions. There was the gold edition and there was the silver edition. Think of it like the Wii U. The Wii U has the 8 gigabyte white basic model and then the more expensive black 32 gigabyte deluxe edition. The idea being one's more expensive but you get more with it. And one's cheaper, more affordable for other people who don't need those extra features. Same basic idea. The gold edition of this console came with the machine, two controllers, one game, and a memory card. And it retailed for $650 US in 1991. Adjusted for inflation, that is $1,100 plus tax. This thing would really punish your wallet if you decided to buy it. I mean, that's, that's madness. Now, but, but there's that more affordable version, for sure. More affordable. Let's go with that one. How much was that? Well, that was just the console and it was a controller. You didn't get any of the other stuff. So yeah, of course it was cheaper. It was $400. Adjusted for inflation, that's $700 today in 2015. Wow, the balls on that. To think that that would be a good idea, that you could just release a console that's that damn expensive. Put that into perspective. The gold edition of this thing, is the amount of money you would have spent to buy that, you could buy a Wii U, PS4, and Xbox One all brand new. That's nuts, but they did it, and props to them because that was a ballsy move. But it should have killed him. Didn't kill him. But they, they did a lot of other things that were bizarre. This one wouldn't hurt them. This probably helped them a bit, but it's definitely worth noting. This console, so this, is, this came out at the height of the bit wars, you know, 8 bits, 16 bits. We weren't quite at the 32 bits or 64 bits era, but this console said, you know what, no, you know what we are? We're 24 bits. 
24 bits. That's like, oh, I'll take a Genesis and add an NES, you know? I know it's more complicated than that, but you get my point. That's a, usually it doubles. It doesn't just add some, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it was bizarre, but that's what they were claiming. And I guess even that is in dispute. People aren't really sure if that's the case. Whatever, I'm not here to debate that. But I, fundamentally, they said it was a 24-bit console, which when you hear that, you go, oh, that's how strange this machine was. That probably helped it a little, yes, but there were other things that definitely didn't help it. Now, one of those things is, well, a lot of it surrounds the games. Now, the games are actually quite good. There's a lot of great games on the Neo Geo AES, but they were incredibly impractical for a lot of reasons. First was that this console had virtually no third-party support. I, in fact, I think, I'm not actually 100% sure of this, but I think SNK made every game on the platform. There might have been a couple of third-party games, but for, I, I am yet to find one or hear about one. And so if there is one, please let me know. I would love to know that. But for the bulk of these games, were all made by SNK. Think about, again, put that in perspective. Imagine if Nintendo made every single game on the Wii U. And I know the joke is that they basically do, but there are some third-party games that get released for that console. Stuff that Nintendo themselves doesn't have to make. Even if they're not that great at games, they do exist. Imagine a console where only one company had to make every game. You hear constantly people talking about, oh, this, this needs more third-party support, that needs more third-party support. And when they don't have it, the console fails. This console didn't have it, didn't fail. <laughs> okay, so that's amazing, defied convention again. Another thing about this console that was insane, when you really think about it is, like I said, SNK made all the games. But at the same time, SNK was willing to take these games and port them to competing hardware. The Sega Genesis, the Super Nintendo, they would get iterations of stuff you would see on the Neo Geo AES. Granted, they'd be inferior versions by comparison, but again, wrap your head around how nuts that is. That would be like Nintendo saying, hey look guys, we got Super Mario 3D World, it's our big exclusive, come get a Wii U, but we're also going to put it on the Xbox One and the PS4. Now, I know a lot of people hate exclusives, but I, I think you get my point at how bizarre that really is. Then what? Well, the games don't even have much variety. So here's the thing, almost every game on this console is a fighting game. There are exceptions, yes, but 90% of them are 2D fighting games. How did you make a console successful when you only had essentially one genre? I don't know, but they did it. And then on top of that, you think you'd get a break considering how expensive the console was? Nope, you don't get a break in the games. See, some of the games, the lower end ones, would retail, which means when they brand, they're brand new and they come out and you can buy them at your local store, they would retail at $50. Okay, that's fine, that's, that's reasonable. Some of them, and we're not talking like eBay resellers or anything on rare games, some of them would retail at $300. And then there was all sorts of prices in between. And again, these prices are 1991. Wow, that, that's amazing. And despite all of these insane things that would have immediately murdered every other console that ever tried it, it didn't. In this case, the console was a success. You wanna know how much of a success this console was? This console came out, like I said, technically in 1990, essentially 1991. It was not discontinued until 2004. 2004, put that in perspective again. That is three years after the discontinuation of the Dreamcast. That is a year before the Xbox 360 came out. Up until 2004, it was still getting games officially from SNK. That is amazing. The only thing I can think of that would kind of justify all the odd decisions they made was that I don't think the Neo Geo AES was really intended to be direct competition for the other consoles. Like, I, their position seemed to be very neutral. Like, they were like the Switzerland of game consoles. They were like, we're over here doing our thing. You guys can all battle it out over there. We're not really going to take sides. I mean, that would kind of explain why they were willing to support both of them and port games over. I think they were just kind of offering you that option, like the, the high class, like the Rolex of game consoles, if you want to think of it that way. But they didn't really need you. It's weird, but I think that's how it was. But they, they, you, you did have that option, technically, if you could afford it. So now let's talk about the actual console itself a little bit, shall we? Take a look at this. This is the controller. 
No, this isn't an arcade stick that I bought separately. This is the stock retail controller that came with this console. Pretty badass, right? I mean, they weren't, when they told you they, you were getting a home arcade experience, they, they weren't playing. You are getting a home arcade experience with this machine. Now, I wanted to get a second one. Unfortunately, that just wasn't viable. The controllers are extraordinarily expensive. So the only thing I've ever really bought for this console since originally getting it was this. This is a, a simple controller converter. And it allows you, if I wanted a second player, if that was ever going to be a thing, I have that option. It plugs in here, and then what you do is you plug in a PS1 or PS2 controller. It's just much more financially viable to do that. But on the console itself, I have like one major criticism. For something that costs this much money, they, they omitted one really obvious thing, which is, you look here on the front, that's how you turn it on, there's just a little switch right there. It has no power LED, which is very bizarre, because cartridge consoles especially always have those, you know, a little light that turns on when the console's on, letting you know it's on. Because sometimes, you know, you put a game in and you don't see anything on your TV, it needs cleaning or whatever. So an LED lets you know that there's no power issues. Without that, it's harder to be sure if there's a problem or not. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not a major complaint, but it's something they definitely should have looked into. And I know I'm not alone in that, because I, I know a lot of people who mod these things on the internet have always make that change. It has a reset button right there, and it's got two controller ports. Now, the controller ports are actually really interesting to me, and I got really excited uh, when I first noticed this. The controller port is identical to an Atari 5200 controller port, which of course had the worst controller of all time, not only because it was a bad design, but also because it's incredibly unreliable. As I did a video on that a long time ago. Well, it's not that long ago, but you can check that out if you want. Point is, bad controller. And I thought, oh, sweet, I could plug this into the Atari 5200 and just use that. Unfortunately, no. It will fit, but internally the connections are different and they don't sync up and they, they, it won't work, so, which is annoying, but whatever. It also has a headphone jack, like the Model 1 Sega Genesis, so you could use the audio through that, either, I'm assuming, through headphones, or if you wanted to connect it to your speaker system that way, you could, I guess. It has a volume dial, again, like the Model 1 Genesis has, or Mega Drive. And it also has a memory card slot, which is interesting. I believe this is actually the first console that had a memory card slot. It's also funny to associate that with a cartridge console, because usually cartridge consoles didn't need that, but it is what it is. On the back, it has a power supply, which I believe is the same as the Sega Genesis Model 1. I'm, I'm not 100% on that, but I think it is. And it has uh, an AV out port that, again, is actually the same as the Sega Genesis Model 1. That one I know. However, again, much like the controllers, I believe the pinout is actually different. It might be the same with composite, but with RGB, it's different. Uh, they, if you have Genesis RGB cables, you can, they will plug in, but they will not work. You have to get a special uh, different set, which is annoying. And I, I should really do that because it, I'm sure it would look beautiful with that. But yeah, that, it's, it's not a bad looking console. It's just obscenely illogical for reasons previously stated. Now let's, uh, you might have noticed the cartridge slot, which we're gonna talk about in a second real soon. But before we do that, I would like to talk about my personal experience getting this console. See, here's the thing. I didn't know anyone who had one. To this day, I don't know anyone that has one. I have never even seen one other than the one right in front of me. And I go to, like, specialty game stores a lot. You know, literally around the world sometimes. I've been to a lot of other countries, check them out. Nobody ever has one. If you had one of these as a kid, congratulations, your parents did really well. Because this thing was, ins like I said before, was insanely expensive, and it's just... It's really illogical to me that anybody would buy this for a kid. Um, and I, but I don't think that's really who they were marketing it towards, but we'll talk about that in a bit. In my case, what happened was I got this in 2004, and I only remember that because after I bought it, only like a few months later, I read on the internet that SNK was officially discontinuing it. And I was like, what? My reaction wasn't what because I was like, no I just got a new console and they're discontinuing it it was like what they were still supporting it I had no fucking idea that anybody that they would still be supporting it that's a long amount of time we'll talk about that in a bit but wow uh, it was whatever in 2004 that's when I picked this thing up what happened was that I went out to a local game store here in Chicago that I, I frequented um, I don't know what possessed me to want to go look out there that day but I did and I got there, and lo and behold, there it is, a fucking Neo Geo AES. I'm just like, oh, because it's a console that everyone knew growing up. I knew about it. 
And this, this is coming from a guy who did not know about the Sega CD or the Sega Saturn, and yet was a Sega fanatic. I didn't know those existed. You know, it wasn't like the TurboGrafx-16 where you knew a guy who had a cousin who had a friend who had one. The Neo Geo was something where somehow, at least at where I went to school, everyone knew what it was. Who was into video games. They all knew what it was. But nobody had one, and nobody knew anybody with one. So when I got one, I was just blown away. I couldn't believe it. And the guy only wanted $150 for it, the console and the controller. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, because you know it is. But for a Neo Geo AES, that is a steal. See, I got it when there was a, a, an awkward time there. I mean, most of the time, the Neo Geo AES was expensive. And then in the early aughts, it dropped. Because I think, I don't know exactly why, probably just lack of demand, no more support, people getting rid of stuff, who knows. But that's when I got it. And then and since, in past years, it's started to go right back up. I mean, I, I look on eBay every once in a while out of curiosity, and I've seen these things go low-end 300, sometimes up to 500, 600, depending on what's in them. Um, which is nuts. But it is what it is. Uh, so I was very happy to get that. Now, but unfortunately, what got me was the games. As I mentioned to you earlier, the games were obscenely expensive when they came out. So I, I literally just picked up the four cheapest games the dude had, and cheap being 25 to 50 range. My, my wallet hated me, but it's, it had to happen. I mean, it's a cartridge console with no other features. You know, if you don't buy any games, it doesn't do anything. So I had to get something. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you all the games I've got for it. Usually when I do these videos, I'm like, hey, I got a bunch of games, this is just some examples. Nope, I literally only have five games. And four of them came with the console. I've only picked up one since, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the uh, first game I got here is Ninja Combat. It's a side-scrolling fighting game. Magician Lord. It's a platforming fighting game, as far as I recall. King of the Monsters, it's a Godzilla clone that's a fighting game. Fatal Fury, undeniably a fighting game, and uh, real bout Fatal Fury Special. It's undoubtedly a fighting game. That, I mean, like I said, it was mostly known for fighting games. Now, the, the only game here I didn't get initially was this one. This is Magician Lord. This is the only game I've picked up for this console since I got it 11 years ago. And the only reason that happened was I was contacted by a guy named Al, who I believe lives in Norway. And he said something to me about, like, do you want like a, a Neo Geo game? And I was like, sure. I thought he meant Neo Geo CD, because I didn't, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but I didn't think it, ever that anybody would be sending me a Neo Geo AES game. And I actually did a video on this at the time when it happened. If you watch that video, you can see my reaction, because I'm opening it up, not sure like how well, this, this must just be a CD game packaged really well, and then I pull out the actual like cartridge thing, and I'm just like, because I couldn't believe that I had a new Neo Geo AES game. They're not common. And this is actually one of the lower end ones, and it was like, it's like a $50 game. And this is one of the cheap ones. That, these games were insanely expensive. But let's take a look at the cartridge. The cartridge is baffling. Look at this. Now, maybe this doesn't mean much in perspective, but uh, without any perspective, I guess I should say. There it is sitting in the console. Not all the way in, now it's all the way in. But uh, when you have it out just like this, if I compare it to, oh, I don't know, a Super Nintendo game, you might get a sense of how much bigger these damn things were. Or how about, how about this? What if you didn't have Super Nintendo? What if you had a Sega Genesis? That's amazing. Now, the other interesting thing about them is that if you look at the bottom of a Genesis or an SNES game, you'll see one you know, PCB board, basically. The Neo Geo AES, despite being so big, the cartridges actually had two. They had two PCB boards. I can't think of any other cartridge console that had two. Um, yeah, so it's, it's bizarre, man. It's really bizarre. And I'm sure that had something to do with the way the arcade hardware worked. Um, I know the arcades uh, actually used cartridges as well that were very, very similar. But unfortunately, SNK kind of went out of their way to make sure that you couldn't just buy the arcade cartridge and plug it in. Because the arcade cartridges are a lot cheaper. But fans have since made like uh, adapters that will allow you to do that. I've never bothered with that because uh, it's just not financially practical. If there's ever an EverDrive release for this thing, which I kind of doubt there will be, I would totally get that. Really quickly, I want to address this because I'm sure a few people will bring it up. This is the Neo Geo X. It looks nice and all that. This is a piece of fucking shit. Do not buy this. It is a clone console that came out a few years ago. I did a video on it at the time it came out. This is the one console in my collection I actually regret buying. And this is coming from a dude who owns a fucking Tiger R-Zone.
Now I'm going to take a moment to talk about the Neo Geo CD, which again, I would do a whole video on if I owned one, but I do not. I actually, I do know a person who has one. Shout out to my buddy Daniel. Congratulations on having one. Now, the Neo Geo CD in a nutshell, um, I think that if it could have been an add-on, SNK probably would have done that. Not really, I'm just kidding. There's no add-on abilities for this thing. It doesn't have a port for it. And it's funny because it's the only console in the fourth generation that doesn't have anything that can be deemed an add-on, whereas every other one does in one way or another. But uh, I think what really happened was that um, in 94, it had been a few years since this thing came out, and I think SNK, maybe just one person in particular, the company as a whole, I don't know, but I think they kind of sensed like, look, this console's really expensive, maybe we should try making a cheaper version. Uh, it's been a few years, the technology's cheaper, and we can use CDs, they're much less expensive than you know, these really expensive cartridges, let's do that. So they released the Neo Geo CD. And so technically, SNK released two consoles in the fourth gen, which is weird. We have not seen another company do that since. And the only other time I can think that we ever saw that before was when Atari released the 2600, they later released the 5200 in the same generation. And in both cases, the successor console, the Atari 5200 and the Neo Geo CD, only lasted a couple of years and then were discontinued and forgotten while the first version lasted and continued. Neo Geo CD was discontinued in 97. This thing was discontinued again in 2004. And the funny part about that is that's not even really where it ended. I mean, officially, yes. But this console is the only competition the Dreamcast has as far as like a psychotic, devout fan base that makes new content for it. Now you guys know the Dreamcast is very near and dear to my heart and I support it incessantly. Every new game that comes out for it, all the independent stuff, I pick it up. But there is just as a devout and awesome fan base that exists for this console. And they, believe it or not, make new games and release them. With the Dreamcast, that, that, that doesn't sound like such a tall order by comparison. I mean, it's, it's a CD console. It's much cheaper to produce the games. There's more units around the world. More people had it, you know, and it's it's easier to ship because it's usually just a jewel case. These guys are making new games out of these giant cartridges, which they're either cannibalizing parts for or they're making brand new ones for a console that almost nobody had. And when the console, the games also, by the way, still cost obscene amounts of money because it's an expensive platform to make anything for. Yet it, it exists and. I salute you, any of you who either support that scene or are part of that scene. That's amazing. Um, and the funny thing, in that sense, the Dreamcast is the sister console of the Neo Geo uh, AES. Because a lot of the independent games that we get on the Dreamcast are actually just Neo Geo community ports. Especially, obviously, from Neo Geo dev team. See, they make a lot of games, especially shmups. And the reason they make... This is funny, too. So yeah, in the Dreamcast scene, we hate shmups, because we get them all the time. Um, we'd like more variety. With the Neo Geo community, well, as I said before, almost all the games are fighting games. So what they want is shmups, because it's something fresh for their console. We just get to kind of benefit from that. They just kind of give us those, um, which is nice of them. It is truly remarkable when you really think about it. The Neo Geo AES getting discontinued in 2004 and launching technically in 1990, the only other consoles that even come close, the Atari 2600 and the PlayStation 2. That's impressive numbers. I mean, the Atari 2600, one of the highest selling consoles ever. PS2, highest selling console ever. Neo Geo AES, nowhere near that list, but still rivals it in terms of official support. So my final thought on this is just, the Neo Geo AES is really fascinating because it's an example, a good example, of what a game console can be when they give you exactly what they claim they're going to. There was no bullshitting you with the Neo Geo AES. It was a home arcade equivalent. And if you had the money, if you cared enough about the arcade experience, this could be yours. You could actually do what they always claim, which is bring the arcade home. Well, they gave you that chance. Uh, but just unfortunately, not enough of us could possibly afford to do that. But nevertheless, it is cool that it existed, and uh, I'm very happy to have it. I feel very fortunate to own a copy of it, man.
So yeah, that's that's it for uh, the seventh part here on the Neo Geo AES, and uh, please stay tuned to part eight, which will of course be on the infamous Philips CDI. Oh yes, I'm looking forward to talking about that. Uh, so thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you all later.